Hello, everyone, and welcome to another segment of Vines Unknown, where we explore different parts of the world, where we bring to you the best of the regions that are not so familiar with us. And in this segment, we're exploring a region in the Peloponnese of Greece. We're going to be exploring Nemea. And with us today, obviously, my co-host, Ari Kalos. Hello. And along with us, our special guest, a uh, not just a special guest, but I think one of, I should say, our resident of our program, <laughs> uh, Johnny Livanos of Diamond Wine Importers. Johnny, welcome to the segment. Thank you. Thanks and for having me. More dear guest of ours that's been participating that we are honored to always have with us. Uh, cookbook author, anthropologist. Uh, she has a fascinating resume and background, but uh, with any ado, let's uh, invite also uh, Susanna Hoffman to the segment. Susanna, thank you so much for always taking time through your busy schedule, because compared to what we do, I say, wow, um, this is <laughs> not to always have you here. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me to stop somehow. Somebody's <laughs> Right, and uh, this is, again, another special segment where um, it's an area in Greece that uh, I've been familiar with over the last 20 years being in the trade. Um, when, when I first started, Nemea, which is that north uh, east corner of the Peloponnese, uh, was basically a focus point then, before Santorini got its uh, popularity and its, um, its credibility in the industry. And that's where I started. I started exploring wines from Greece from that part of the world. And then things evolved and things change. And, I, and I'm glad that we're back here because I think um, we need to show some more uh, insight on this very special part of Greece. Um, for me, I always considered Nemea back then as the Napa of Greece, even though it doesn't really uh, make a direct connection, but that's the way I kind of like to explain it to those that are not familiar with Nemea. But that's why we have Johnny and Susanna here with us. Uh, Johnny, uh, Tell us a little bit more about in your experiences and your thoughts about uh, the region of Nemea. Yeah, so it's funny. It actually, this was Nemea was the first, the wines from Nemea were the first Greek wines that I had um, <laughs> that made me want to dig more into Greek wine. So I, I before uh, moving back to New York, I lived in Washington, D.C., uh, and I was working, I was a bar manager at a restaurant called Zaytinia, oh, nice. and they had a big Greek wine program. And I remember I had the Skouras. Uh, Moscow Filero and the Ayoritigo, the St. George, uh, which we are featuring today, both those wines. And I was just blown away at the level of quality, um, the flavor components, just all about these wines. And it's something that I wasn't familiar with. I didn't realize Greece had such really beautiful, approachable styles of wine that were also uh, so unique and had so much history. Um, so yeah, first, the first, one of the first regions I got introduced to, and now I just ended up dedicating my life and career to Greek wine. So that was, I feel like that was, this, this region was like the focal point, the starting point for me. Right. Um, so yeah, so, um, as you said, Nemea kind of is like the Napa, uh, of Greece. And I, I think I like to think of that because of its proximity to Athens. I think that's a big, a big plus for the region is that it's so close, so close. to Athens. You could drive there it's near the city of Naflio, which is the um and Susanna correct me if I'm wrong I believe it's the original capital of Greece the original capital yeah yeah so the original capital of Greece is right there right near this region of of Nemea of modern Greece modern really? yeah yeah the original cap the capital of modern Greece and um so there's basically two wines that grow in this region well first of all Nemea is the the PDO or protected designation of origin for uh, the what, the grape Ayoritico. So I'm going to share my screen. Actually, I'm going to I'm going to show a little a couple slides just to kind of talk about the region a little bit. Uh, all right, one moment. So well, here we are. Here's our map of Greece. Um, Athens is right there in the middle, and then if you drive over the Corinth Canal, you're right there. So Na Naflio is somewhere in this area here in this little red splotch. This is the region of Nemea. And then as a whole, we're talking about the whole Peloponnese today. Uh, and right here, this yellow orange spot is Mantenia. So these are the two main wine regions of the Peloponnesos. So the Peloponnese is a peninsula. It kind of looks like a giant island, but it's connected by a tiny, tiny strip of land right here um, over the, the Corinth Canal. Um, 
Mantinia is dedicated to white wine, uh, the grape Moscofilero. And then Nemea is dedicated 100% to Ayoritico, which is a red wine region. Um, and the region in his historically was called uh, St. George, Ayos Yorgos, uh, which is where the name of the grape comes from, Ayoritico. And Ayoritico means St. George in Greece. Um, and I'm just going to go through a couple slides, show some pictures, and then we could just chat casually mm -hmm. about, about the wines. Uh, and then we're, we're, we're featuring three wines from the, our a producer we import, uh, Domain Scuras. Um, and the two wines we're tasting again, Mosco Filero, Ayoritico. So these are some pictures of the grapes. Um, what I love about this region is, and you, know, you compared it to, to Napa Valley. Remember, Napa is Napa's like a very, there's a lot of mountains and hills. It's a valley. Um, and Ayorit uh, Nemea and, and, and Mantania both are high elevation vineyards. So then the Peloponnese, and in Greece in general, a lot of people think that Greece is just islands, but Greece is, I think it's over 70% covered in mountains. So it's actually, there are a lot of high altitude wine regions and Mantania where the Mosco Filero grows, it's actually one of the tallest or highest elevation of wine, vineyards in, in Europe. Um, for, for this, the wine we're tasting today, the white wine, Mosco Filero, it's um, about 2000 feet of elevation, which is really, really, really high altitude, which creates really flavorful, flavorful wines. Uh, so this is George Skouras. He's the uh, founder of Domain Skouras, and he's one of the modern, the godfathers of modern Greek winemaking. Um, he built Domain Skouras in 1986, and he, he studied in France and Dijon and brought a lot of his experience working in France and applying those to, to Greek varietals. And then we got his son, Dimitri, who's taken over, and he's, he's a great uh, winemaker and is, is the next generation. And I have some, some pictures. You can see how it is like a rolling, rolling hills and valleys. And this is the, the, um, the Mantinia uh, region. You can see some of these beautiful tall mountains and with vineyards just facing the sun. Um, so really unique climate terroir here. Definitely worth visiting. I highly recommend going there if you're traveling to Greece. Um, it's only a short drive from Athens. So you don't, have to, you don't have to take a flight or a ferry. It's right there. You, take, you can take a, a bus. Um, and I have a quick video. Can I play this? This is just yeah. George Scoros describing yeah. Moscow Filero. Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, he's just better at describing it than me. And I, I love the way he speaks <laughs> about it. He speaks like, like poetry, the way he talks about these grapes. Can you hear it okay? Um, Actually, I don't hear it. No. Um, they, they take my headphones out. Oh, there it goes. It is uh, in the center of Peloponnese. I make wine out of uh, Moscofilero the last 30 year, years. Uh, Moscofilero, it is uh, a great uh, variety. In the Wait, I realize I can, can share my audio. I think that make it that may make it easier to hear. Oh. Sorry. One moment, guys. All right, tell me if this is better now. Oh, yeah, beautiful. Okay, Moscow Filero, it is, uh, it is my grape. I love that grape very much. It is uh, in the center of Peloponnese. I make wine uh, with, uh, with the Moscow Filero the last 20 year, years. Uh, Moscow Filero, it is uh, a great uh, variety in this, which we can find in the center of Peloponnese, in the plateau. Up and, and there is, and for that, because of that, it's typical. Huh? Uh, at about uh, 2,200 feet, and uh, up there it is a cold area of Peloponnese. Imagine that uh, the harvest comes in October. That means uh, a lot. Uh, as this area it is, uh, it's a cold area. The uh, Moscow filler preserves the aromatics. By itself, the, um, the, the grapes of Moscow filler, they have uh, red skin, which is not exactly red because there are a lot of clones. So there is the Aspro filler, white filler, uh, which is a uh, Green, more green. There is the xanthophilero, which is the um, bl uh, blonde, uh, blonde filero. Mm -hmm. 
which is another grape, another, it's like the gewürztraminer. in there. There is the Mavrofilero, which is the black filero. So there is a lot of different grapes, uh, but uh, there is color on the skin. And the wine have not color. It's unbelievable. It's uh, like transparent. <laughs> but um, the wine, it is uh, always having such uh, of beautiful aromatics, basin uh, in, in flowers. The rose petals, the violet, the jasmine, um, you know, the uh, sweet citron, um, all these citrusy aromas comes uh, from, from the Moscofidero. It is really very, very pleasant. At the same time, Moscofidero have a very nice acidity. The Moscofilero, it is a little bit hard to work because you never know when to, to stop to get color or not in your pressure, pressure. Uh, which is, uh, you know, we go for uh, just a 50% of uh, free round juice for making the wine. After that we can have colors and um, it is, uh, it is a vineyard, it's, it's, the grapes magnificent. They resist very, very well to um, to the rain and everything like that. It's an excellent grape for make. Uh, for me. I mean, I feel very lucky to have that grape in Greece. Cool. So yeah, just wanted to share that because I feel like he he talks so well about, <laughs> about Moscow Filero, and sometimes it's uh, it's hard. To, Hard to speak better than the man who's made this wine himself. Uh, so Mosco Filero again is one of the main is the main white variety of this region, um, and maybe we should have a little taste before we talk about Absolutely. the rest. So I think we're, we're we have two different well two Mosco Fileros from Scudas, right? <laughs> but they're equally delicious. But one obviously is different than the other, right? Yeah. So we have the two. We have the the regular Mosco Filero. Uh, and then, yep, so that's a 2019 Moscow Filero from Skouras. That's the classic style. And uh, one thing he didn't mention that I think is important mentioning, like the words Moscow Filero, it's, it's kind of, it basically means like the smell of flowers. And this is when you have this wine for the first time, you're kind of struck by how floral it is. It's a very delicious, bright floral wine. Really, really, really aromatic. Uh, it kind of reminds me of like a Greek style dry Riesling or Greek Gewürztraminer or Pinot Gris, like wines in that category that are like light but aromatic at the same time. Mm. Um, that's something I really love about them. They're so fresh, they're so complex, aromatic, floral, just really delicious. Plus, they go with a lot of different dishes because they have the bright acidity, um, and having high acidity does help with pairing with food. That's Absolutely. always something to keep in mind. Absolutely. Um, I'm a big fan of Moscow Filler. I'm, I'm a big fan of white wine. I drink a ton of different types of white wines. But what I like to suggest or recommend um, whites uh, in general, Moscow Filler is in that top uh, selection of recommendations. And I don't even tell people what it is before I let them try it. I just let them try it first and then I tell them what happens after. Mm -hmm. And it always yeah. works. That's always a good idea. Uh, <laughs> Because I feel like a lot of times, especially when people are trying wines from countries that they're not familiar with or trying wines that they don't know so well, it's kind of nice to just let them taste it without having any preconceived idea mm -hmm. of what it is. And that's something I love to do when I'm sharing wine with people. Awesome. Just like get them try it and then talk to them about it. You know, let them make their own uh, ha have their own opinion, form their own opinion about the wine without maybe bringing in any sort of incorrect biases to, to maybe taint their experience. And that's something I always like to do. Let people really taste it for what it is and then tell them, like, talk about the history uh, and what makes it unique. Yeah, I, I love this wine. Um, so, and what, what George Scorus was mentioning in the video, how the, it's a unique grape because there are so many different types of clones that all fall under the same family of Moscow Filero. Um, and it's unique because it is a white grape, but it has a pink skin. Um, so you have, if you actually go to see the grapes, they don't look white. You almost you'd think they're like you're making a rosé or something out of them. Right. Yeah. And actually, the second Moscow Filero we have is the, um, the Salto Moscow Filero. Um, so no, it's another style from George Scuras. Um, and this is another version. Yep. So the Salto Moscow Filero is 100% made with the Mavro Filero clone. 
Uh, so Mavro Filero is, it means like the black Filero. So it's a much darker skinned version of the grape. But it's still uh, white grape. But it's still white, yeah. So it's still white, but it has a little bit more complexity because of the skin, the, the skin color has more compounds in there. Um, and what makes this unique this wine extra special is they use only wild yeast to ferment the wine. Uh, so, you know, a lot of times when you're making a wine, you use, um, you know, you're using inoculated yeast, special yeasts like, that you want. Uh, but by using the wild yeasts, you're basically capturing flavor that is in natural to the, to the region, to the area. Um, and so it's a little bit more, you know, terroir driven, completely capturing all the flavors that are special to the region of Montania and the Peloponnese. And Johnny, where is the, where did the term Salto come from? That's, is that it? Cause That's a, here's the thing when, when, uh, and I've, and I've come across this before. I always get asked, does the wine taste salty? Yeah. So no, it doesn't. Right. No, but there's some element of um, dryness mm -hmm. that, I don't know if that's where it comes from or if there's some other um, relation to the term salto, but. You know, I always get asked these questions where, where, where the names come from. And I don't, I, I don't always know. Um, yeah. I, I can't oh. honestly, honestly <laughs> name that answer the name, answer that, but. Uh, um, yeah. I'll, maybe I like to say alto means tall well, and it's a high elevation. I just answered, I just answered my own question. <laughs> <laughs> on the back, on the back uh, of the label. Maybe, the maybe, label. maybe Susanna has some insight. I don't know. Well, I think we should start with the meaning of the name Menemea. Okay. Which means it comes from the verb to grape. It means grazing land, and so it was, um, you know, a, a wonderful land. Which originally, of course, then when the Greeks came in, they had cattle, but now you would see that it, it's sheep and goats and um, beautiful rolling hills. Um, and it was famous, and this may have something to do with the term, it was famous for its celery, the area. So, or wild celery. You had to realize that Greeks, as well as the, uh, drinking wonderful wine and having indigenous grapes, have about 125 different wild greens that wow. they eat. And um, among them, wild celeries, wild parsleys, um, all kinds of cress. And this area is famous for all of those. You can go on. Are, uh, are they known for the term Horta? Yes, uh, which is the same as our, our cohort, somebody that you farm with. Is what it is. Really? I never, never knew that. Susanna, <laughs> you're always such a pleasure because I always learn something new with you. <laughs> it's true. There's so much to, there's so much to learn. It's, I love that. I didn't know that at all. And since you're speaking of aroma, do you realize what aroma means? It comes from homa, which means soil, which means that it is the scent of freshly turned dirt. Oh, oh interesting. <laughs> wow. Have <laughs> you seen the movie, My Big Fat Greek Wedding? It's like, the word comes from <laughs> this word. <laughs> <laughs> That's I know. Awesome. I, I, lo I love the Moscow Filaros. I think they're incredibly refreshing, um, the variety of them, the complexity. Um, for me, um, I may be kind of off the, off the margins here, but I find it more a summer wine. Mm -hmm. I really, really enjoy its refreshingness. I am absolutely a devotee of Ayurveda and um, of the lowlands and the highlands and everything from cinnamon and fruits to chocolate an oak in them, which I absolutely adore. So I, I don't know whether we're going to get that far, but uh, <laughs> if we move up to the other regions, you know, I'm also just to add a few, a few notes about how long it's been a great growing region. Of course, this is the Argolid, which is from Argos, and it's and, and Mistini is in it, um, as in as is Corinthos. So this is the center of the Mycenaean um, civilization and where Argos and Jason and the Argonauts sailed from and where the whole Iliad and Odyssey take place. Um, they sail from here. And the mythology of Nemea and the Lion of Nemea in, uh, that Heracles uh, uh, conquers. So there are Minoan sites. There are many, many Mycenaean sites. Um, they, of course, were already infiltrating when the Minoans still were um, uh, dominant. 
and only became uh, took over after the Minoans disappeared with the um, eruption of Santorini. And so they've been growing these grapes for 2,000 years. Wow. Yeah. So did, did these like Mycenaeans and these voyages uh, include wine in their voyages? Do we have any like rec recollection recordings of that? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, but the main thing they were trading, in all honesty, was olive oil. Really? They were the first to um, be able to press actual olive oil, the, the Minoans were. And you can still see a lot of their circulars, their, their, their press. And the, the trade was major, the major thing was in olive oil. But in terms of the grapes, they took the grapes, they and the, Mycen the Mycenaeans and the early Greeks took the grapes all over the Levant, that is Lebanon and Israel, all over Turkey, up through what is now Armenia and Croatia, over to France, up the Loire Valley, and over to Spain. So when people talk about the Agiorgitico related to Sangiovese in Italy, it's mm. probably accurate. Um, and certainly um, most of the, if you take the DNA down of many of the grapes of Italy and, and the, the whole Mediterranean region, you'll find that they came from um, Greeks spre uh, spreading the grape seeds. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, I, I wanna make a quick comment to what you just mentioned, Susanna. When I first was introduced to Ayurgitico, this is going back 25 years. And at that time, and I remember listening to um, George Skouras, where he was giving us uh, a lecture about um, Nemea, where in the beginning, they were still trying to understand Ayurgitico from a, uh, from a farming, from growing, and from a production standpoint. And they, they were trying to master it, or they were trying to um, refine it. So when I first started tasting Agurgitico 25 years ago, back then when they were producing it, the, the, uh, the thought was it reminded people of something close to Gamay or wines from Beaujolais, right? And then as time went on and they started to actually uh, evolve and they got better at producing uh, their, make, their wine practices and Agurgitico was evolving, now you mentioned when we when we drink different selections of a Yudhiko from the mayor, it's reminding of us of Sangiovese. It's it's amazing how over 20 years how the evolution of the flavor profile, the characteristics have changed because of the methods and the mastering of the grape have changed as well. That now we find ourselves that it's being more related to a different part of the world. And there, I'm, it's fascinating to just listen to what you're saying, and then I'm listening to myself on what I remember uh, Agurgitico from what it used to taste like and what it tastes like today. Those are all good points, yeah. And I, f I feel like the, depending on the, the winemaker, you could get a lot of different t styles and types of Agurgitico. And, you know, actually in the, in the region of Nemea, they also make sweet wine, dessert wine uh, out of Agurgitico as well, uh, which is really interesting to see how one grape, one region could make a, a plenty different, a lot of different styles and types uh, of wine. Um, yeah, because I think the St. George that we have today from, from Skouras is kind of like Gamay style, like a Pinot Noir. It is a little bit, a little bit lighter, uh, but then I've had other, other ones that are maybe aged in a barrel for two years and they have this richness. They have their, like kind of like a Sangiovese flavor where they are really earthy and have so much going on in depth. Uh, and it's cool to see, depending on the winemaker and the, the location of the vineyards, you could have kind of like a, a just a range from the variety, which is really fun to see. And, what, and mm -hmm. what's interesting too about Nemea is that I noticed most producers um, also produce estate wines. So they grow their own grapes versus mm -hmm. purchasing their grapes. Yeah. which I find to be very fascinating uh, within a small region compared to other parts of the world. Definitely. Yeah, and, and, and Domingue Skouras also, he, he has all, all this, his own vineyards that he grows his own grapes, uh, which all go into his, his line of, of, of wines. Uh, and the St. George is one of his most popular, best-selling labels, but he also has the Grand Cuvée, uh, which is a single vineyard uh, expression uh, using aging in all new oak as well as the, you've had the Megasinos, which is a blend of Ayuritico and Cabernet. One so, of my favorites. Yeah, a few different types of styles using, using, the, using the Ayuritico grape. If I'm not mistaken, I think Megasinos was the first label uh, from Nemea to really uh, elevate and put um, 
the the Ayurvedico variety on a high tier. Uh, like Megasinos was like the cuvee or the um, uh, the reserve of Ayurvedicos um, mm -hmm. that you know really touched upon the interest of non you know or international wine drinkers. Megacinos. Totally. Yeah. No, that was one of the first wines that we imported. Um, and I think before that wine came to the States, the first vintage, I think, was uh, the 1986 vintage was the first vintage. And so, yeah, right now we're on the we're on the 25 years almost. And um, that was one of the first wines from Greece to kind of put Greek wines on a, a more on a more bring kind of theme to the region and, and show that. Greek, Greek winemakers are taking this seriously and are able to produce really delicious, serious, age-worthy wines that can compete, you know, with France, Italy, Spain, U.S. Uh, and the Megasinos was that label, was that brand that kind of turned the attention and the spotlight onto Greece, yeah. uh, which is great because, you know, I think he had to blend Cabernet in there to, for people to be like, oh, I, I'll taste, I know Cabernet, I'll drink that. I, I, and then from right. there, it opened the doors and allowed us to... Um, whoa, I think my first was the was the Grand Reserve. Yeah, which um, I still am extremely fond of, um, and it's, it's a more the Highland um, Ayurgitico, don't you? Wouldn't you say a little more mm -hmm. chocolatey, a little less fruit forward, um, but still within the the Ayurgitico, um range of, of flavor. Still, certainly a little more fruit forward than the Xinomavro. Mm -hmm. But um, um, absolutely delightful. Totally. I definitely cool. agree. And it's awesome how like having a higher altitude vineyard yeah. creates so much more flavor. And I think that's what makes in a lot of the Greek wine and the wine growing regions so special and so unique is that they grow on these high altitude, re high altitude valleys and mountains. Uh, so you, you capture so much, so much flavor, so much aroma, so much complexity. Um, and it just it just speaks to the uniqueness uh, and the biodiversity of Greece and their terroir. Um, I'm sure we're going to be starting to get some questions uh, mm -hmm. coming in soon, but um, <clears throat> so Nemea now, I mean, being cultivated for so many years, we Saint George. So it's named after Saint George, right? The variety. So it's named after, if I'm not mistaken, Susanna. Was there a Byzantine church in Nemea? Uh, called yeah. St. George. That's what it comes from. And of course, St. George, as uh, with many countries, including England, St. George is the patron saint of Greece. Okay. And you have to realize what George means because most people don't. And that is the geo, D-E-O on George yeah. is the same as geography, geology. It means earth. earth. So George was a farmer. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> that's what George means. That's what that, so all the Georges I know, I'm going to start calling them farmers. Yes, you're going to call them. That is, makes there, sense. is there any is there that any i feel like i heard this but I, maybe it's a rumor and i feel like Susanna might know but i, I always thought that people called the wine saint george because you know in the icons of saint yorgos you see him with the spear yes. like st st uh stabbing a dragon or like a, a monster and it's like the blood i don't know in, into the in the vines I, i've heard that i don't know if that's true or not someone that's just a made-up myth i think that's well, uh, yeah that's you know, a little uh, as, um, as Greeks, we love rewriting the narrative. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's probably more because he was the patron saint of the region. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it means little Saint George. It doesn't mean direct Saint George. It means little tiny Saint. Yeah. Little Saint George. <laughs> <laughs> is there a still? Is do you do we know? Is that church still there? Or is that way no. way? I don't, right, got, I don't know. Excellent. Um, you know, Susanna, um, I've always noticed that when you, uh, when we ship wine, because we have that ability, you always get a lot of Nemea in your packages, <laughs> right? Yes. That says a lot for us. Because, <laughs> um, you know, we get a lot of, a lot of, uh, questions. We get a lot of emails and we get a lot of folks, uh, those, for those that actually are heavy red wine drinkers and want to try Greek reds, they're always asking, you know, what can you recommend? Because I love to drink cabs. I'm a red blend, you know, red blend drinker. Usually we always uh, gravitate to wines from the Mea, not because they're exactly like that, 
But I think because they have enough structure, they have enough depth, they have great flavor profiles. And recently in the last handful of years, they're so well balanced mm -hmm. that I think that uh, anyone that's tried wines from Nemea are immediately sold on wines. Oh, totally. Right? They're, they're so approachable. And, and I feel like they, they work with a variety of palate types. Right. And when I was working at my family's mm -hmm. restaurants, I felt like I could, I could never would fail I would never make someone upset when I brought a bottle of Ayuritico to the table because nice. it's, it's, it's a type of wine that like, if you're a Cabernet drinker, I think you'd like it. If you're a Pinot Noir drinker, you're going to love it. If you like Sangiovese, you're going to love it. There's something in there's, that has components of all those types of wines. Right. It, it, it doesn't resemble all of them, but it has little aspects of each of them in it that I think makes it a versatile wine that depending on who you are, what kind of wines you like, it's great. And that's why it's, it's a great wine for parties. Like um, it's a great wine. If you're having a dinner over with a lot of people and, and you don't know what to open up because it's something that goes well with food. They age well, you know, they're, they, 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 depending on who's making them, they, they typically age them in Oak or a variety of styles of Oak. Uh, so they tend to do very well aging. Um, and they're pretty value driven wines. They're, they're, not, they're, that. they're not that expensive. And I feel like this, the score of St. George, for example, I, I, I'm not sure Ari, how, uh, uh, Fuck well, how much you sell it for, but you know, it, it retails in the mid teens. Yeah, I mean, under $20. Under and $20. I think you, you're getting a bottle of wine that tastes a lot more expensive than it is, Correct. Uh, which is, and, and people really tend to, to they, people really do love it. Um, so yeah, you know, I, a, a very famous uh, wine critic who claims that this is the wine he served at Easter and yeah. he's not Greek. <laughs> who is that? It's a, it's a perfect Easter wine. It's perfect, you know? And I think that's appropriate. Yeah. I did get, actually, I bought magnums of uh, St. George Skouras for Easter for my family. Because um, one bottle is not enough for my, my, my Greek family. Oh, no. So I got to get double-sized bottles. And, and it, was, it was definitely a hit. Because um, they have, you know, if they're full, they have enough body and tannins to kind of <laughs> match up to the, to the to meat, to lamb. Right. Uh, but at the same time, they're not overly tannic. They're very kind of in the middle. So you could, you could have a few glasses over the course of the, of the Easter day while you're waiting for the lamb to finish roasting. <laughs> well, we got Thanksgiving coming up, right? So I'm then, sure yeah. uh, there's a place on the table for Ayurhitiko for 100%. sure. 100%. Um, because I know that as Greek families, and we still do this as much as we, you know, we think that we're going to change that. Right next to the turkey, there's always platters of some type of lamb dish. Uh huh. That's how my family does it. <laughs> I have a, my family is a mix of Italian and Greek, so we yep. do a turkey. My mom makes a lasagna, and then my my grandma or my dad will do like a, a lamb roulade. It's always a whole medley, and I can't wake I can't wake up the next day without, without well, holding my stomach up. Johnny, I, I think I'm coming to your house for Easter, so <laughs> prepare yourself. You have to add what I do. I, I, I make scordalia and I cover a splather the turkey in scordalia while I'm roasting it. Wait, wait that yes. is genius. And the crust is amazing. Do you do like a potato scordalia? Yes, a potato almond scordalia. And, uh, it, and I mean, I slather it. It's covered in it. And the crust comes out, oh, you know, a good quarter of an inch covered in garlic paste. Yeah. Uh, John, Johnny, I'm, cancel yeah. my uh, <laughs> cancel my trip to your house. I'm going to Susanna's. Susanna, we got to do a cooking demo with you. Well, yeah, that's great. I just learned something new. Because, you know, the turkey, it's funny because every Thanksgiving, it's like the last thing everyone eats. We always eat the Greek stuff first. Right. <laughs> and uh, I, that could be a way to save tur the turkey this year. Covered in scordalia. For those of you who, who don't know what scordalia is, it's a classic Greek dish or accompaniment. Or uh, it's a it's all of the above. It's a lot of things. It's yeah. it's like depending on how you make it, it could be a dip. But it's potato based with garlic, and some people make it with bread and garlic, and some people use and there's always like almonds or nuts sometimes involved. Um, but the main thing is the garlic. Greek and, uh, lots of garlic. Lots of garlic. <laughs> and um, I, I will add something to that. It is the main thing that Greeks argue over. Whose mother makes it best? Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. I, I want to cover my turkey with that and then have a glass of Ayuritiko <laughs> on the side. And I think I'll be happy, a happy person this Thanksgiving. Oh, man. We should do like a virtual connection and, and, and try uh, during Thanksgiving and see what's going on. 
Oh yeah, I'm gonna take. I'll take pictures and I'll show you. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> oh, I mean, that, that's Johnny's polite way of saying no, Fati. I'm not gonna. Uh, I'll, I'll have. I'll have you in I'll real have this, time. I'll have Zoom in the background. I have to. <laughs> I'll be cooking the turkey. Well, I can't. I don't. I'm just saying. Uh, we're gonna have a lot of Zoom Thanksgivings this this year. <laughs> it's funny. This is the first Thanksgiving where you know, it's gonna be less than thirty people in my house. It's crazy. Yeah, we're just mm-hmm. doing only the immediate family and. And my a few cousins. Well, but we'll see. It'll probably grow by the time Thanksgiving comes around. We'll make no sure one, have, no one, feel, no one has the heart to say no to somebody. <laughs> right. Exactly. Um, but in any do I I think that uh, we've got some good questions that just came in from our from our mm-hmm. audience, and we'd like to take the time to kind of give them some um, attention to what they're asking. Sure. Ari, you want to run down some of the questions that came in? Uh, sure. Okay. Um, I think the first one is, uh, do they make sparkling? Um, I mean, they make sparkling all around Greece, but I do not believe in Nemea it can be called Nemea if it's sparkling, because Nemea is only red grapes, it's only Ayoritico. Okay. Um, I've never actually had a sparkling Moscow filetto before. Actually, but... I'm going to jump in real quick. Yeah. I have, uh, there is a sparkling from Montenia, mm-hmm. and Mr. Um, Yanis Telepos, um, the main Telepos, uh, actually produces a sparkling called Amalia that's made from Moscow Filero. Oh, yeah, I did have that. I and forgot that was a, uh, Moscow Filero. That's a uh, champagne method uh, sparkler. So, yeah, they do. They, well, in Montenia, that's the only one that I'm aware of. Um, I believe you're right. Um, so, but I, as Johnny had said, I think that uh, different producers, and we did have, for example, in our last segment, we had uh, Stamatis Milonas uh, on, and he's in Atiki, and they're exploring sparkling wine. So I think that more the areas around Greece are starting to explore this category. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yes. we, we import some sparklings from northern Greece. Uh, and also in Santorini, they do make some sparkling mm. wine as well mm. um, with the Sirtico. And um, we're actually, we're going to, we just brought in a limited amount of sparkling pet nat from Santorini uh, from Vasaltis, which is going to be really nice. Um, When's that going to come? Because we had a, a few came in earlier this year and okay. it sold out instantly. And we are now bringing in a bunch. So Johnny, uh, I think at the end of the year, we have some more coming in. Can you just tell us real quickly to our audience, what does pet nat mean? <laughs> it means it's a, it's like a shortened of like two French words, petillant natural. Uh, yeah. So it's like, it's a more traditional, um, it's called like an ancient method of producing sparkling wine. So, you know, you have a lot of different ways to make, uh, sparkling wines method charmat where you uh the wine goes through secondary fermentation in a tank uh, yeah. which gets all the bubbles and in, into the wines uh, then you have method champenois which is the champagne st- uh the champagne oh. method basically how they make how they make wine uh sparkling wine and champagne where secondary fermentation occurs in the bottle um and that's how the carbonation gets into it um, and then the pet nat is like a, it's an ancient method or a rural or artisanal method um, where basically it's bottled, the wine is bottled before fermentation is complete. Um, right. So when, there's, when they're doing fermentation, you know, fermentation creates alcohol, uh, it creates CO2 as well. Uh, and normally the CO2 is released out. Um, but mm. this basically before the bottle, the wine is finished fermenting, they put it in a bottle and cap it. So it finishes fermentation in the bottle, which allows you know, all that carbon dioxide and natural sugars in the grapes to just kind of capture and, and create uh, carbonation inside the bottle. But typically they're a little bit lighter in terms of, of how f- uh, carbonated they are compared to champagne. Right. Um, but t- typically I feel like your most pet nats you see nowadays are um, they're kind of a little bit funkier, they're a little, little bit funky, more yeah. unique. Um, so yeah, when, you pour, when you pour a glass of pet nut and you and it's cloudy and mucky looking, it's okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, they're more again, they're more of like an artisanal. Um, what's the word? Just like a rustic style of winemaking, mm-hmm. but it, they have a lot of fun flavors, and um, there's so many different types now that I've been trying where they have a little bit of sourness to it, but in a good way. Um, okay. Yeah, they make them all over all over the world, and it's becoming a lot more popular now. 
so as like a natural Nat. wine movement is starting to grow. Yeah, keep keep your uh, Ari, keep your eyes out on Petnet. Oh, you know, I was I was a little bit embarrassed because when he said when he first said Petnet, I laughed along with you guys, but I had no idea what he was talking about. So, thanks Fati for asking him to explain that. Um, one more question, uh, actually a couple more questions. Uh, in the same vein of the first question, how about rosés? Yeah, so I, I believe technically, if it's if it's to, if it has a Nemea label. It has to be a red wine, but they do make rosés out of Ayuritico. Um, and George Scuras actually makes a rosé called the Zoe, um, the Zoe rosé, which is a blend of actually Ayuritico and Mosco Filero. Uh, so it has both, ver both grapes in there. Um, so like you have the floral aromatics freshness from the Mosco Filero, and then the Ayuritico gives it some body and the color. Um, so they do make rosés in the region. Um, but yeah, some, you know, with the, the actual, the PDO, the appellation of Nemea oftentimes comes with rules and laws that they must follow to call the, the wine Nemea. So I don't think you could have a rosé called Nemea, but I'm sure but people do make rosés yeah. in, in that yeah. region and with the, with the Ayuritico variety. Okay. So, but let's, call it, let's call it Rosé Ayuritico from the Peloponnese. Excellent. All right. Uh, one uh, another question. Uh, do Nemea wines age well? Oh mm. yes. <laughs> I like I like that response. <laughs> yeah. I mean they, they they age very very well. I mean what I love about these wines is that you can drink them young. You can drink them fresh. You know they tend to they they're meant to be drunk now. But with aging, they just get better and more complex and, and delicious. And yeah, I, I think they age very, very well. They have strong tannins, so that helps the wines develop in the bottle. Um, but yeah, they're great because you can have them now or you could, you, could, you know, I definitely like buy six bottles, have one now, have one next year, and then leave one in there for That's a while. That's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> have happen. some now, save some for later. Yeah. Um, okay, one more question as far as I see here. Um, do they grow other red grapes in Nemea? So they do grow them, but like to be considered Nemea, it has to be Ayuritico. So mm. Nemea is really like 100% dedicated to Ayuritico. Um, but probably in the areas surrounding Nemea is where you'll they'll grow other grapes. I mean, George Scuras, his, his winery produces Chardonnay. He produces Syrah. He produces Cabernet, Mosco Filero. So he grows, he makes a lot of different types of wine in that region. But Nemea is really just 100% Ayuritico. Um, that's that's the best. That's a grape that does the best in that region. Uh, so people focus on that grape in in Nemea, uh, and Ayuritico in Nemea. But they do they can grow other wines, other grapes, but it's just not going to have the Nemea stamp. They, you know, they'll they'll bottle it as a separate thing. Um. Uh, somebody. Oh. All right. Somebody wrote spirits. I'm going to assume they mean spirits. spirits. <laughs> Maybe tzipurro. <laughs> yeah, so um, we, uh, Diamond Importers, we import uh, tzipurro, which is a Greek grape distillate um, and from, uh, from a distillery called Verino, uh, which is in the similar region in the Peloponnese. And he, he buys all the grape skins from George Scuras and he makes fantastic tzipuros out of Ayuritico and out of Mosco Filero. Um, and so to make tzipuro, you take, you take the skins and sediment, basically after you finish making the wine, you take the leftover skins and then you go and you distill that. Uh, basically all the, all the alcohol, the wine that was left in the skins, now you could capture that and bottle it. So you have this really extremely flavorful, aromatic spirit called tzipuro that comes from the, the grape to this region. So yes, they do. They do. They do make fantastic spirits in this region, mainly tipuro. So nothing goes to waste. No, nothing. nothing uh, and another, another um, you know, it's. I guess it's kind of close. The pot, the, the city of Patra, uh, is Patra is pretty close to to Nemea. Couple That's, hours, right? Yeah, a couple hours, but it's on this. It's the same uh, west coast. Yeah, well, northwest in the Peloponnese, right? Yeah. Yeah, they make a spirit called Tentura. Uh, tentura is a cinnamon liqueur um, that they they basically they don't not, they don't cinnamon doesn't it's not something you really grow in Greece but because it, it, it spice trade passed through the town of Patra um, they had a lot of different spices like cloves and cinnamon that passed through that it, it was trading in there and they would make liqueurs out of them so tentura is another spirit that you could find from that region. I have a question for Susanna. 
Are you a Tsipuro or a key drinker? Tsipuria. Tsipuria. <laughs> oh, yeah. Corrected. Corrected. Susanna, uh, I just want to tell you, uh, my mom's maiden name is Tsikudakis. Oh. So she she told me growing up that her family invented Tsikudia, and I like to believe that that's true. So Where are you're welcome. Everybody. Royalties, royalties, my friend. <laughs> but uh, I think it's fascinating that uh, this whole like circle of growing grapes, producing wine, and then taking what's left over and producing spirits, which actually end up becoming, they're called apostagmata, mm -hmm. but they're also a form of digestivos. They help us digest the whole experience that we just went through food and wine. Isn't that, to me, that's fascinating. Yeah, I love that. And you know that, and nothing, goes, nothing goes to waste. You know, that's you, why Tsipuro in Greece, it's, it's so plentiful. It's, it's abundant. You, could, you find it everywhere. And it's pretty inexpensive. Um, it's you know it's a casual drink you have everywhere in the tavernas, and it's because the, in Greece no one's throwing away the skins. Like no one's just going to throw anything away. Nothing's going to go to waste. So every every drop of juice from those grapes is going to be put cool. in a bottle um, and and consumed in one form or another. And now I'm coming across this. Uh, this tell new people you should tell people. That Tsipora and Tikudia are the same thing. Yeah. They are. <laughs> just, yeah. just a dialect difference. So depending where you come from, from in Greece, no one wants to group it as one thing. It's like we, we own this. We of own course this. not. But, uh, but basically, the, it's the same thing. The other but thing that um, that I'm coming across lately, uh, if you haven't come, if you haven't seen yourself, is eight barrel age Tsipora Tikudia. That's becoming a thing. <laughs> Yes, it right? is so good. That's yeah, crazy. it's it's like it's like com taking cognac, but like adding s aroma to it. Like cognac, I, I don't drink too much cognac or armagnac, but I I have some barrel aged cipros where they're just they're so soft and smooth and and like they're mysterious too. Like you, it's perfect after dinner drink, right. um, but they're da they're dangerous because they're so easy to drink that they go you, down you don't realize they're like forty five percent alcohol. <laughs> so the fact that we're getting into this new world of aging tipuro or barrel aging and it's to me it's like wow this is amazing because no one would ever think that uh tipuro would, would take this level of um production but i'm getting a lot of uh conversations with others that are seeking out barrel aged tipuro or tsikudia yeah well you know grape grape based spirits and grapes in general they, grape products like wine and, and brandy they do well in barrel aging those flavors the flavors of the barrel i think help tipuro develop and change um and i think you know in greece like they a lot of people were always you know they rather have had ordered cognac right like they were or bourbon or you know, they weren't looking at what they could make of themselves so they never thought to barrel age it and now you're starting over the last 20 years you're starting to see people you know do more experimentation right, and, more, right, right. and i think uh, yeah, this i've been trying to study a little bit about tipuro its history and it's a very unique thing because only until the 2000s were you legally allowed to commercially like sell tipuro. Like before that, it was really just something you were making like, at home. Yeah, it was just like it was like that was it. You were just it was something you either made at home or you had like one distillery in the village that would that would basically make tipuro with everyone's grapes. You weren't bottling it and going to a liquor store and like buying tipuro. Yeah. You know, yeah, now that you say that, I think you're right. Like, yeah. I never saw Tsipuro prior to 2000. No, no, anyway. yeah, you weren't, it wasn't something you commercially, there was no commercial distilleries for Tsipuro. There would be like more smaller, smaller production, more just to sh share with neighbors. But now that, that the market is open, you could commercially produce it. You're going to see people, because basically they could sell it now. So there's more money that could go into it. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, maybe that's what my mom was talking about when she said her family invented it. <laughs> yeah. well, distilling came quite late to Greece. I mean, yeah. uh, they, 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 in, in the ancient times, they certainly had every kind of wine and all of these uh, indigenous grapes that you can imagine, but they didn't distill anything, but strangely enough, they did distill turpentine. It was only about 500 years ago that they actually began to distill what the remainders of the grape. So um, I'm not it's saying amazing. that this is new, um, and Sibia, but it's, it's uh, in Greece's terms, it's relatively. Yeah. Mm. 
who was there someone responsible for teaching them how to distill? I think it all goes to the monks. I mean, Cipro <laughs> does. Cipro, Cipro started, I think, so Johnny, in the monasteries in northern Greece, in, in so the south, if, in Mount Athos. If I wanted to make Cipro in my backyard, can I still call it Cipro? No, legally you could only call it protected. Yeah, legally you could only call it Cipro if it's from Greece. Because I, I correct me if I'm wrong. I, I there was somebody in either Pennsylvania or New York, upstate New York, that was actually trying to bottle domestic tipuro. There's, there's also I heard it. I think it was in Oregon actually. <laughs> Oregon? There was a, yeah, yeah, somewhere. There was a distillery bottle. making. You no, know, no, no. Okay, in Oregon there was a distillery making uzo, and then I think it was in New Jersey a distillery making tipuro. Um, and I, you know, I think they're still calling it tipuro, but technically. Technically, they can't. Technically, it's it's against the the rules of the EU. You know, the well, EU protects good. protects Cipro like, the same well, way champagne has to come from Champagne, France. And what if your what if your legal last name is Tsukudaki? I think I think, you, I think only Ari gets a pass. Then you you might you might be able to slip a slip a Greek uh, it's one, it's one to be little Tsipro. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm a I'm a Tsukudaki. <laughs> you, you could only make it in little bottles then you, then you'd be okay excellent wow this is great this is i mean we've learned so much in this segment um even though we're like you know choosing certain regions we're just like really dissecting and breaking it down with uh fun facts history uh you know plenty of knowledge um this is where it's at when it comes to i think in my opinion uh exploring learning and understanding because i think at the end of the day understanding uh, it translates to appreciating. I think when someone really appreciates the understanding, then things do taste better. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, just by trying new wines from different regions, you get to travel the world, you know, and, and I, we love traveling to the regions of Greece, especially in this group. I think anyone joining us now is, is a, <laughs> loves Greek, but uh, you know, Greece is such a unique and diverse country that you could go to all these different regions and try something completely different with a whole different story and history behind it. So you know, definitely recommend continue to try new things and travel, travel through the, vi the villages and, and vineyards of Greece through their wines. Susanna, anything that you want to kind of include uh, towards this last part of our segment about Nemea? Anything that you want to add before we kind of come to a close? Well, in, in, in talking about the different regions, um, remember that in ancient times, Greece was just a whole series of tribes. They weren't united Greece. And so uh, when you took each region, such as Nemea and, and the others and, and, the, and Sparta, which certainly became the dominant force in the, in the Peloponnesus, was a collection of different tribals, tribes of regions. And, and that's partly why you're getting so many different indigenous grapes and approaches to the wines. So um, mm. if, if we think of Greece as united, um, it's only been united for a very short time. It was uh, diverse and tribal uh, and uh, and essentially what held it together was the Greek Orthodox religion as mm. opposed to a government. And I'm still surprised that we're still united. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently here too. Uh, right, 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 right. So I think, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I think we're good. We're, 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 we're no more questions. And I think, I mean, I had an amazing, this, this was actually a really good uh, webinar. I, I learned a lot myself. I, I had a lot of fun and it like flew by. And I just want to say, thank you so much. Uh, Susanna, your, your, your knowledge, uh, your history. I mean, I'm a, I'm a history geek myself. And like, sometimes when you like teach me these things, which I'm on the internet, like basically 12 hours a day, I'm like, how do I not know these things? Like, thank you so much for, for, for the knowledge that you bring. Johnny, I mean, you're our brother, man. So thank you, thank you so much for everything <laughs> you're doing. Thank you so much for the knowledge you bring. Thank you so much for the multiple, multiple webinars that you do with us we love you and you know you're a handsome guy you look like me that's what i hear so you know <laughs> that's a bonus yeah. for you and and before we forget i want to also add that for those of us that are intrigued about the wines that we were discussing and tasting uh they are available on our platform on our shopping cart at urbanwineclub.co and also greekwineclub.co i should mention that as well 
and coming soon, uh, there's another platform that Ari's going to mention that we can find all of our Greek wine products along with Greek food products. I, I wasn't actually going to mention it because you're all business. I'm all just, you know, uh, loving everybody, but I'll mention it. We're, we're releasing an app, a, a Greek shopping app. So look out for that. Uh, but something very important, I think, uh, dear to all of our hearts, uh, we have a, a donation campaign for uh, the people of Samos uh, for the earthquake. So we'll, uh, we'll post the link to that as well with our video and podcast. But I just want to say thank you so much again. Johnny, you're awesome. You know your stuff, man. And, and we appreciate your time. Um, Susanna, you are amazing. You have four books coming out and you still made it here. Um, and I didn't even sing my, my official Oh Susanna song to you when you join tonight. <laughs> the next one. The next one. <laughs> I'll, I'll do it next time. I forgot this time. But it's a they, non, not Ari, it's a nonsense song. So for you, it's appropriate. Oh, yes, exactly. <laughs> See? See? Susanna knows me very well. <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Thanks, everybody out there. Thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Foti. Thank you. We will see you guys next time. Thanks, everyone. And good night. Kalinikta. Kalinikta. Yamas. Kalinikta.